This is an oral history recording with Richard Slaughter, who is the retired chief of police of the city of Deland, Florida. The interviewer is Margaret Jones, who is a volunteer with the West Volusia Historical Society. Today is January 19th, 2017, and we are doing this interview in the Deland House. Richard, where were you born and when? I was born November the 25th, 1940, in the land, up at the old hospital on North Stone Street, which is now part of uh, uh, Bill Drugger's Park. <clears throat> my brother was also born in that hospital. My brother, younger brother Pete, was born there on February the 2nd, 1946. At the time I was born, my father, W.M. Bill Slaughter, was employed by the Volusia County Sheriff's Office. And my mother was employed at the clerk's office in the circuit court in Volusia County, the old courthouse on West Wisconsin Ave or West uh, New York Avenue. Uh, at the time my brother was born, my dad was working for the uh, DeLand Police Department and my mother was working for the Athens Theater as the head cashier. Uh, my father also had a part-time business when Pete was born. He had a riding stable on Hubbard Avenue, which is across from the football stadium. Now I believe there's a city well and a parking lot. It's part of Earl Brown Park, a skateboard area there. And across the street from there on Amelia was nothing. There was just woods. It was part of the old golf course, all the way from there to Garfield and part of it, all the way through to Boston and uh, all the way south to uh, Beersford Avenue with nothing but woods. Uh, I know sometimes we would take horses from the riding stable home. We had a big vacant lot next to our house. We lived at 116 North Orange, which was only a block and a half from the hospital. And um, the day or the morning that my brother was born, we had a couple of horses at the house and my dad saddled the horses and we rode the horses up to the hospital. And I was too young, I was only five years old, they wouldn't let me in the hospital. So I sat in the parking lot on my horse and held the reins to my dad's horse and he pointed which window for me to look at in the hospital. And he went in and about five or 10 minutes later, my mother came to the window and held Pete up. And that's the first look I ever got at my younger brother who was sitting on a horse in the parking lot to the hospital. And uh, that was, uh, I mean, we didn't, we didn't ride horses every day, of course. There was cars. I'm not that old. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's uh, my, now my mother. My mother's name was uh, Frances Elizabeth Franey Slaughter. Both my mom and my dad were native Floridians. My dad was born in a small town over on the Suwannee River, not far from Bell, Florida, I think it's Gilchrist County, named Wanee, W-H-A-N-E-E. -E. The last time I was over there, there was no town called Wanee, but there was a little plaque next to a boat ramp on the Suwannee River that had Wanee on it. My mother, uh, my father came from a farming family. My mother was born in a little town just east of Tallahassee named Chairs, Florida, and uh, her father was in the logging industry. So to give you a background, at least I'm a, a second generation Floridian, maybe third, because I know a lot of my father's other people came from Florida. But um, that's basically a, a brief history of, oh yes, and I had a, a, a half brother that was older than me. His name was Roger. My father was married previously to be married to my mother. But mm -hmm. Roger didn't live with us. Uh, he lived with his mother in uh, Connecticut. But he did come and visit us once in a while. We got to know him pretty well. Your older brother's name? It was Roger. Roger. Roger Wilton. And we all called him Buddy. Mm -hmm. But he, uh, he graduated from the University of Miami with a degree in art. And... Uh, he died when, two years after he graduated from the University of Miami with Hodgkin's disease, which is, you know, it's curable now or manageable now, but back then it wasn't. It was a, just kind of like a death sentence if you got it. And that's what happened to him. 
He's buried out here in Oakdale. Okay. Your mother and father met where? They met in a courthouse. My father was a deputy sheriff, and my mother worked in the clerk's office in the courthouse. And uh, he was in and out with papers to be processed and warrants and stuff like that, and that's where the two of them met, was in the courthouse. He was the deputy sheriff? He was the deputy sheriff of Volusia County at that time. His career in law enforcement spanned a wide number of years. Around 47, I think, 45 to 47. Mm -hmm. He started off in, uh, with Daytona Beach Police Department in uh, the mid, late, late 20s, I guess. And then he went with the sheriff's office. Then from the sheriff's office, he went to Deland PD. And he ran for constable while he was employed by Deland PD and was elected as constable. And then he finished his career it was a constable of the 4th District here in DeLand. And that concept changed, uh, the, const the constable? They, they voted, well, uh, they voted the constables and the JPs out in 1973, so he was a constable from around 1950 to 73. That's when they were abolished. Mm -hmm. so, JP meaning Justice of the Peace? Justice okay. of the Peace, right. Okay. So uh, you... Went to the police um, station was, with your dad some, and how'd you get? Uh, I was kind of born and raised in law enforcement, right. but uh, actually, I didn't. Uh, I never dreamed I was going to be a police officer. I, uh, I always worked part time. I dreamed of uh, furthering my education, mm -hmm. and uh, after graduation from high school, I, I was uh, one of the charter members at DB. Daytona Beach Junior College, it was called in those days, 1958. They had started building a campus where the, the current campus is, but they hadn't finished the buildings at that time. So we went to classes at the, the at least the uh, Princess Sassina Hotel over on Seabreeze Avenue. And that's where every uh, classroom we had had its own bathroom, but nobody used them. But anyway, that's. There was hotel rooms that we went in for, for class until we could move in for the second semester at the uh, at the main campus. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of it was kind of hard because when you walked out of the door of the Princess Sassina, you could look to the east and see the arch to the to the uh, Plaza Hotel at the beach. Mm -hmm. It wasn't very far. It was kind of hard to concentrate. Mm -hmm. But uh, your mother, you were telling me, I believe, worked for the Athens Theater at one point. Yes, she was the head, uh, head cashier at the Aston Theater when my brother was born. I can remember when I was, when I was real young, sometimes on Saturday, I would go with her to the, uh, to the theater, and there an old gentleman who was a custodian that would let me follow him around when he was sweeping out the, the aisles and stuff, and he'd let me look for, I didn't have a flashlight, he'd let me keep the pennies and stuff I would find that would fall out of people's pockets when they were sitting in the movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was one of the highlights when I, when I, for a six-year-old. How did she feel about your father being a policeman? Well, I, I always looked Law up to him because everyone seemed to, uh, everyone seemed to know him in town, and everybody respected him. And uh, yeah, like I say, he was a, he was a good father. My mother was the best mother anybody could ever ask for. Uh, he always took me with him, or my brother and I with him when he could. I can remember. From the time I was probably seven or eight years old, riding with him on Saturday nights, and uh, we would just ride through the different sections of town, waiting on a call, you know, radio in his in his uh, vehicle, which was hooked up with the sheriff's office dispatch system. Mm -hmm. But his district now was not near as large as the sheriff. He had basically the the same powers as the sheriff for the fourth district. His district included the land that went west of the river, south halfway to Orange City, halfway to Delenn Springs to the north, and to the east it went to what we call the halfway house between here and Daytona. But there was, I think, like 14 constables and JPs for Volusia County as a total because Seville had its own constable and JP, Pearson did, Delenn Springs, Orange City, in all the different uh, cities and municipalities on the east side of the county had their own constables and JPs in addition to the sheriff. I know my father told me when he first started with the sheriff's office back in the 40s, 
there was only uh, the sheriff and four deputies for the entire Volusia County. And three of them were based in, in uh, DeLand because it was the county seat as it is now. And um, he said when he, when he left the sheriff's office, it had doubled the, the size of the department in Daytona. They had two deputies in Daytona then. Mm -hmm. And he went from there to being the police chief he went of from DeLand. There, he went with, uh, from there he went with the police department in DeLand. You were telling me about old Sparky and uh, oh, how many yes, that cases was, that he had. That go ahead. When my dad was with the sheriff's office, he, uh, he invested, quite, investigated quite a few of uh, homicide cases, and he had a stacks of uh, these old True Detective magazines and and law enforcement magazines because we didn't have TV back in those days. And uh, if you wanted to hear the news, you read the newspaper or listen to the radio, and uh, I would learn, think, you know, look through those things, and uh, he had sent out of seven people when they did an article on him when he retired in 1973. There was an article that, and uh, since they had the electric chair in Stark, there had only been seven people sent to the electric chair from Volusia County, and he had sent four out of the seven in his career. And most of those were with when he was with the sheriff's office. I can't remember one when he was with the land PD. Mm -hmm. It was a it was a pretty bad murder case that a, a man who owned a bakery here in Deland, uh, Mr. Turner, his wife was murdered. And it's because everybody knew that Mr. Turner went to he go down and start making donuts at two o'clock in the morning when. Uh, to get them to the restaurants by the time they opened up in the morning for business and uh, everybody knew his wife and children were all home alone and it didn't take my father too long to figure out who he, a good suspect what is and ended up being a, a former employee that he'd fired, Mr. Turner had fired probably you know, th three or four weeks prior to the murder. And it was, uh, it's kind of a gruesome situation. I wasn't supposed to see him, but I saw some pictures laying around, some uh, photographs that were taken of the crime scene, and it was uh, something to make an impression on you. I believe you have an article about some of his work in another case that he handled where he had solved it, but it, some evidence was missing. Yes, that was one that, uh, that uh, the, I think they call that the Duchess. There was a... Uh, Lady found dead between here and Deland in a car, and uh, he was one of the officers that it was first one on the scene. And he sifted through the sand and, uh, you know, looked over the, the the evidence at the scene, and he found a piece of a gun. It was a stock out of a gun. He said it looked like a half moon that had been busted out of the stock on a pistol, and also a couple of uh, spent shells. And of course, he entered them into evidence and all that, but the case went on and on and on. And uh, something, some like 20 years later, when he was a constable, he, uh, there was a fellow that had a gun for sale that he'd, he'd bought from some guy. He didn't know where it came from. And my dad saw the gun and he noticed a crescent thing out of the stock missing. It looked like a uh, ivory or a pearl handle. So he bought the gun from this guy, knowing it was probably stolen. And when he ran the serial number on the gun, he found out that it had been uh, sold in Canada to a resident of the land. But everyone that had been involved in it, you know, he went back to the courthouse. Back at those days, they kept the evidence in the basement of the courthouse. And the evidence was gone. The uh, piece of the stock that was from the gun and the uh, spent shells were gone. And uh, so... Uh, there was no way to continue with it. And in addition to that, most of the people that were involved in it were deceased this, by this time anyway. Okay, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, your children, ch what children you have, and could you tell us? What? Children. Oh, yes, I'm, uh, I've been married and divorced three times. It's probably a hazard for law enforcement in a way, but... Uh, my first wife, Ann Eller, she had a son by a previous marriage, Kevin. And uh, Ann resides in Ocala, and Kevin and his family 
reside in Ocala. Kevin and his wife and his daughter, Maddie, live in Ocala now. They're doing real well. My second wife and I, uh, my second wife went to Stetson. Teresa D was her name, and we'd had no children. And uh, after we were divorced, uh, I married a girl named Peggy Broadbent. And Peggy had a, a stepdaughter, Kayla Broadbent, who was, uh, she's still here. She's employed by Dr. Patel, uh, Dr. V.P. Patel, out on Stone Street, doing real well. And then we had a son, my only natural child is a son, Rafe. And uh, he was born in 1992. So, uh, those are, those are the children that I have right now. My daughter, my, my stepdaughter, has uh, two children, a boy and a girl, about a year apart. One of the little girl's name is Kara, and the boy's name is Wyatt. I don't know where she got Wyatt. I guess Wyatt Earp or something. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's and my son. I know Mrs. Rollins, who... Uh, Raised a lot of kids around here. I think she raised 80, some of her 80s kids and just about everybody around here. She used to, but she'd, she'd watch them until they were about three years old, you know, and then she didn't want them anymore. She wanted somebody else to take them after that. And uh, I know she used to say that Rafe, a boy, he was too pretty to be a boy. And then I was telling her son, Ron, who owns the fish camp, or Ricky, who owns the fish camp, Highland Park. I said, you know, uh, I wish your mother was alive so I could show her a picture of him now because the one that she said was too pretty to be a boy, to look at him now with his beard and everything, he looks like a poster for birth control. <laughs> but he's doing well. He's employed by a, a McMahon Construction Company. Bob okay. Kellogg gave him okay. a job. He's working for him now. He, he has a prepaid college as, as well as my, my daughter had the prepaid college, but I guess okay. they... They think it's just something I, I wanted to spend some money on for no reason because they don't seem to be <laughs> in any big hurry to take advantage of it. Well, your education started out here and ended in the land, at least uh, elementary. And tell us about that a little bit. Started off with the, what? the three schools that you attended here oh, yes. in the land, and then went on went to college. And well, I was uh, raised one sixteen North Orange, and I went to Wisconsin Avenue School. Uh, Deland Junior High and Deland Senior High, and they were all only about five blocks from our house. And so I could walk to school from the time I entered first grade until the time I graduated from high school. I could walk from our house to school. It wouldn't take five minutes. I know the Wisconsin Avenue schools and the 300 block of, uh, of West Wisconsin Avenue, and it's now called Dempsey, well, it was changed to Dempsey Brewster because Ms. Brewster was, a, was the uh, principal. We were going to school there, and it was named after her. The junior high was across the, uh, we call it the sand pit, from uh, Wisconsin Avenue School. It was faced uh, Rich Avenue. And the high school faced uh, Clara. The high school was on Clara, so they were all right there within a block. So, and like I say, when I graduated from uh, from high school, I was one of the charter members of Daytona Beach Junior College. And I attended the junior college in Daytona off and on for about four years. I'd work part-time and, and go to school part-time. And, and like I say, uh, going to school in a beach town wasn't real conducive to learning. And my, I, I loved the beach. I, I liked school, but I didn't like it near as much as I liked the beach. But uh, Anyway, uh, I never graduated from, from junior college, but I, I kept going. The last, the last semester I attended, I would, had gotten a part-time job as a dispatcher for the police department for about six months. And I'd, uh, I'd been going to school pretty much full-time then and working part-time. I, I made $90 a month, which I was rolling in the dough back then. Probably only had to work about 25 hours a week. But uh, when I, uh, then they had a vacancy, and when they had the vacancy for patrol, I just turned 21. So I uh, applied for that and was appointed to that position. And I got a big raise, but that was working full time. And I, I think it's, I started there at $320 a month. 
And, but I was working full time. What year full-time. would that have been? That would have been uh, about 1961. Okay. That's when I turned, November of 1961, I would turn 21. Mm-hmm. And uh, I only worked for about six months, but I had a problem with my scheduling my classes because on the evening shift and midnight shift, I didn't have any problems. And we changed every week. Schedules changed every week. But on the day shift, I had I used Monday and Friday as my days off. And back then, the land had parking meters. They had them on everywhere. They had parking lots, and they had them on uh, New York Avenue. They had them on the boulevard. And so my shift commander, Tom Odom, who was a lieutenant, he let me go in and pick up the money on Wednesdays when, I was on, when we were on the day shift, pick up the parking meter money and count it and have it ready for uh, when they came to work about 7.30 to take to the bank. And then they'd let me off, and I could make my Wednesday classes. At Daytona Beach Junior College, so that's the way I spent my last semester. And then my aunt and my uncle, who were in a car dealer, car business in uh, Jacksonville and Green Cove, they made me an offer that if I wanted to go to school full time for a couple of years, they would help me. But tuition and uh, dorm only, no uh, no cars and stuff like that, and food, and food, of course. So I, sn- I jumped at that. And, uh, I put some applications in and everything, and I, I was uh, chosen. I was admitted to University of Mississippi. Uh, my, my brother, uh, as I told you earlier, he had gone to University of Miami, graduated from the University of Miami with a degree in art. And he was the first one in the Slaughter family to get a, a college degree. And I know I went with my dad to his graduation in Miami it was probably, uh, he was born in 32, 14, probably about 1954. I was probably about 14 when he graduated. I never seen anybody happier than my dad was to see my brother graduate from college. And while he was there, he was the president of the KA fraternity, which was an old Southern fraternity. And so, and then, like I say, several years after that, he died, and it took a lot out of my dad. And I, I kept remembering how proud my father was of him, you know. And, and I had been accepted at a couple of schools. I'd been accepted at the University of Mississippi, University of Nevada, University of Maryland. And, uh, but I got to thinking, you know, you, as far as the Southern school goes and everything, you couldn't beat University of Mississippi. So I decided to go to Mississippi rather than the others. And it, it was far enough away from the beach, you know, that I could concentrate on my studies. <laughs> And, but it wasn't as cold. I, I checked on the temperatures in Nevada, and it was the low was ever recorded was 41 below zero, and the highest was 130 degrees. I said that's even worse than Florida. So, uh, and Maryland wasn't much better. But anyway, I ended up in Mississippi, and my my uh, aunt, and my uncle, owe them that, and uh, so that's they're about two and a half years. At the University of Mississippi, I went to summer schools and everything else. In Florida, you had to have 120 hours to graduate. In Mississippi, you had to have 130 hours to graduate bachelor's degree. But anyway, that was that was one of the proudest days of my life because my mother, and my my father, and my my brother and his wife, and my aunt and uncle, both came to the uh, graduation service, and uh, I remember that smile on my dad's face just like it was when my older brother graduated. Well, that made it worth a haul. What did you do then after you graduated? Well, I'd apply. I'd taken the LSAT, LSAT test, which is the law school entrance exam, and I'd sent notifications to. Uh, well, they let you choose four or five schools that you want the results of your test sent to, and so I, I put. I think I named four schools, <coughs> and. Uh, but I never had any idea that I passed that test. I said, when I walked out of there, it was an eight-hour test. I said, no way I passed this test. No way on God's green earth I could have made it through that thing. And, uh, but I did. And uh, I was accepted at, at the University of Mississippi. That was one of the schools that I'd put down because they had a law school at, on the same campus that I was going to. It wasn't like Stetson, you know, where the law school had been moved to St. Pete. But they had a law school, a, a pharmacy school, and a medical school 
for the University of Mississippi. The medical school was in Jackson, and I applied it at uh, Cumberland, which is now Stanford, I believe, in Birmingham, Alabama. I think it's Stanford. Yeah, Stanford. Yeah. And that was a. Uh, yes. And they they accepted me, and but I I just said I I was thinking about that, and my uncle, he wanted me to go to work for General Motors, and so uh, I was batting it back and forth, and. I finally decided, I said, I think I'm going to try law school. And that kind of upset my uncle a little bit. He and my aunt were having some problems anyway. And uh, so I went back to law school. And uh, But my aunt and uncle were divorced. In the meantime, I'm, during my first semester up there, and I had what you call a funding problem. I didn't have any money. <laughs> it's kind of hard, hard to go through uh, law school with no money. So... Uh, I left law school and came home and went to the Cape. The Cape was booming, and I had several officers at the Cape office with uh, GE, and uh, not GE, but RCA and Boeing. And uh, I applied there, and then a, a vacancy came up with the Deland Police Department again. So I said, well, I could live at home, and uh, it would be a lot cheaper than, uh, even though I was a little less money. So what year would this have been, and where was your father at the time? My father was constable. He was still constable. here. He was still okay. constable in Deland. This was and my brother was a, my brother was employed by the Deland Police Department at that time. Okay. But uh, I applied for it, and I asked him before I applied. I said, you know, I'm not. I don't want to push my brother out of a job because of nepotism. Said, no, we just put y'all on different shifts if you're if you're accepted. So I said, well, okay. So they did. They uh, they decided to hire me. And uh, Pete was working at the same time I was, but they kept us on different shifts. We didn't work together. Neither one of us was a supervisor over the other, which was one of the main concerns. So uh, then Pete, uh, I was there probably the second year I was there, maybe third year I was there, that uh, Pete uh, had an offer with the sheriff's office. It's when Ed Duff was the sheriff of Lucia County, and he left and went with the sheriff's office. And I stayed with the land PD, and my father was still constable during all this time. So uh, that's uh, that's the, basically how I got back in law enforcement. And uh, of course, the the chief that was there at the time that I went back to work for the PD had a problem with a city manager at that time, and he was fired. And uh, they hired a new city manager at the time. Uh, Wayne Sand, well, no, they, they hired, well, it was an interim city manager, Jack Johnson. They put him in as an interim city manager, who was Ben's dad. It was just recently retired sheriff. It was his dad. And uh, they found uh, a retired colonel from the Army, Wesley Farmer, who was working for a newspaper in Deltona. And they offered him the job, and he came up. And he was the, uh, he took over as police chief in the land. And the only two people that had college degrees in the police department was the chief and me, the patrolman, one of the newest patrolmen. And about the same time, they came up with this state rules and regulations that for, the, for additional education, you got extra money. And the state required the cities or counties, whoever you work, work for, pay you so many dollars for so many extra hours of college hours. And so I ended up making a little bit more money than some of the patrolmen that had been there three or four years longer than me, which calls for a few hard feelings, but a lot of them I knew had grown up with. And uh, we, we kind of settled the differences, but that was my start with the Lamb Police Department again. And, and promotional exams, of Colonel Farmer believed in the and testing and oral boards and all that, you know, I guess much the same they do in the Army. And so I, I had a, actually I had a little advantage over a lot of them because I'd been used to taking tests at college for so long. And so I tested well and, uh, you know, I, I knew on oral boards and stuff like that how you, how you, you know, you told an oral board what they wanted to hear, not what you necessarily do, but what they wanted to hear if you wanted to be promoted. And so that's the way I, I went up the ladder. So you started with the police department in what year? At, at that was in 1966. Because you graduated from college. I started the second time okay. when I graduated, after I graduated from college. 
Okay. And then how did you progress to the being chief? Well, uh, when the, the, new, the new, they brought in a new city manager. The, uh, they, hired, they hired a new city manager And then he didn't work out either, and they fired him, the commission did, and hired Wayne Sanborn. Wayne was down in uh, Arcadia. He was the city manager in Arcadia at that time, and he came up from Arcadia as a new city manager. And I can remember I was a patrolman, and I was working a midnight shift at the old basement at the police department in Deland, and this guy walks in, with a Yankee accent, you know, a Maine accent, you know, and he introduced himself, so I'm the new city manager, and I told him who I was. And he wanted to know if there was a, somebody could help him unload and put his stuff upstairs in the office, and I said, sure. I said, let me call. That was one of the nights a dispatcher called in sick, and so there was only two of us working, one had to work radio, and the other one had the whole city of the land to themselves. So uh, I called in the other patrolman that was working, and, he worked the radio and answered the phones while I helped Wayne unload his car and take the stuff into his office. And we were friends ever since then, you know, since I helped him do that. And when when Wayne decided to leave, Paul Pounds, who was a good friend of mine, had come up through the ranks like me, and had worked part or he worked full time and gone to school part time and got his degree in criminal justice. And when Wayne left, he appointed Paul as the police chief because he told me basically that he said, you know, I had the degree when I went there. He said, and uh, you know, I watched Paul work his way up going to school, part-time, working full-time, studying when he could and all that. He said, you already had it. I haven't seen you go to too many schools to try to get a master's degree or anything. I said, well, you're right. So he appointed uh, Paul as a police chief, which was fine. Paul and I were good friends. And I was, ended up being a major. So uh, then Paul had a run in. When Wayne left, they hired another city manager, a guy named Brant. And he didn't get along with most of the department heads. I mean, I wasn't a department head, so I didn't have to deal with him that much. But uh, anyway, it wasn't long before he hit the road. They fired him. And he had hired an assistant city manager named Phil Penland. And Phil, they hired Phil to take over from uh, Brant when Brant was fired. And Phil and Paul didn't get along. So they had a run in right off the bat. And uh, I had known Phil from the time he was assistant city manager. And he came to my house one night. I was married to my first wife. He told me, he said, I'm going to fire the city, I'm going to fire the police chief. I said, What for? He said, We just don't see eye to eye. Every, he wants to fight me at every commission meeting and all that. He says, Commissioners are get tired of it. And I'm getting tired of it. I said, well, he's always been a, a good friend. And he said, I know. He said, but he said, I want you to know if you'd be interested in a job. I said, I don't think so. <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe I want that kind of uh, job security, you know. And uh, he said, well, you think about it. You think about it. I said, well, let me talk to Paul. He said, oh, is you in, in, insistent on firing him? He said, well... I said, suppose I could talk him into us just switching positions. He said, I might entertain that. He said, the commission might. I'd have to run it by the commission. I said, okay. So I talked to Paul, and we talked for a long time. And he said, he said, I knew that. He said, I knew something was fixing to happen. He said, but he said, I would urge you to take it. He said, I wish you would take it. He said, and switch places. He said, you know, maybe you can do a little better thing than I've done because in the meantime they'd unionized. The department had unionized, and we had. To, PBA to deal with. Um, uh, so I went back and talked to the city manager, Phil, and he said, uh, okay. I said, but I, I said, I'm this, I want a contract. He said, what? I said, I, I want a contract. I said, I don't want to just be at your whim, you know, if you don't like the way I part my hair or something like that, you fire me. I don't have any money anymore or anything else. He said, what do you want in a contract? And I'd been studying up on collective bargaining in the unions. And, uh, so I came up with what I wanted to contract. And he said, I have to run it by the commission. And he did, and they agreed to it. And basically all it was was that he could bust me back at any time. If he didn't like the way I combed my hair, he could bust me back as major, but no cut and pay. 
But anything other than that, I had a right to a public hearing before the full commission and the public. And uh, they agreed to it. So, and uh, we switched places, Paul and I, within a year. I was, I was handling negotiations for the city of Deland for the blue collar workers that unionized also. They had Laborers International Union and I was handling negotiations for management against LIU and the PBA against my own police officers. And I said, this is not, not right. So I called a meeting in my, my department. I called a meeting and everybody was there. I said, you know, guys, I said, you know, I, I think you need a lot of the things you're asking for, that your union is, is, is asking for. I said, and I, you know, I said, but you can either have me represent you or you can have the union represent you, but you can't have both. I said, because the city has hired me part-time to handle negotiations against the PBA and against LIU, and I'm going to continue to do that. But I said, you know, I just can't represent you and, and, and uh, the city at the same time. And so they, they called for a decertification vote, and it was only 28 of them that were members of the, of the bargaining group, and they voted unanimously, 28, to, to uh, decertify the union. And from then on until I retired, we never had another union. But I was able to convince the, uh, the city manager and the commission the year that they decertified that everybody got almost a 20% across the board raise. And uh, that seemed to please a lot of them. But, you know, DeLand has always been a training ground for, for other departments. I mean, there's no way that can, DeLand can compete with uh, Orlando, Daytona, Seminole County, places like this, especially back, back then. Now it's getting more where they can, a little bit better. But back then, when I was a police chief, 46% of the property in the city of the land was tax exempt. It was owned by Stetson or the churches or schools or, or city or county, all these different organizations. And it was like, I think it was 46, 44, 46% of the, all the property in the city was tax exempt. But they started annexation programs, annexing a lot more land and stuff like that. And, and since then, the tax base has come up a good bit, a real good bit. But uh, that's uh, in the next 22 years. You started as the chief in 1976? 76. 76, right. okay. In the next 22 years? November 1976. And I retired in uh, January 1999. 22 years, two months, and two days. 33 years of the city all total. You had one year where I believe you told me you had 12 murders in one particular year. Yes, that was, uh, the land's always been kind of a laid back place, but it, you know, you could tell things changing with the population increase and uh, drugs and stuff like that. And the family, it seemed like the family values were going down, you know, and, uh, and there was no respect anymore for law enforcement or anyone else. No respect for parents or anything like that for a long time. And when crack raised its ugly head, we had gone from maybe a murder every couple of years or something like that to uh, where one year we had 12, 12 murders. And we questioned every one of them. I mean, I had my CID people. There was only one that went unsolved. But all the rest of them we solved. And, I had my commanders and my criminal investigation division make sure that there were questions as to why. Why would they kill these people? And most of them said that they kill the people for fear of being uh, recognized and identified. And the majority of those, why had they broken into them and, and been discovered and been forced to kill them and all that was to uh, support their drug habits. To steal to get money to, to pay for the drugs. And that's when the, we really noticed the big change. That and the, and the laws and stuff, the laws seemed to, there for a long time, seemed to swing in the opposite direction. And uh, seems to be coming back the other way a little bit, but not a whole lot. So were drugs the main 
thing that you, you had the most of, the most cases mm -hmm. involving, involving drugs and oh, yeah, uh, we, some domestic kinds of things. And, yeah, we had about mm -hmm. a lot. We just, you know, just in questioning, we'd always ask them, why, why did you burglarize this place? Why did you uh, uh, rob this person or rob this store and all that? In 70% of the cases, 70, 75% of the cases was support the drug habit. Was that true all the way till 1999 when you yeah. retired? Sure was. We didn't notice any big difference. You know, they said it was a difference in, in the drugs going down and all that. We never noticed that. And I had, them, I had my people do surveys probably every four or five years because that would come up. And we'd give the press the information and they wouldn't print it. So. What do you think the biggest difference between when you first being, started being chief and over the 22 years, what was the biggest change? There's been a lot of, been a lot of changes. A whole lot of changes. Like when I first started, we didn't have a, a, a motor division. I started the motorcycles and uh, K-9 units. We got a K-9 unit started. We had a couple officers that we got dogs for. And with the help of Stetson, Stetson got a, uh, gave us a couple of mountain bikes, and we tried to downtown patrol officers riding bicycles. And uh, that seemed to work. The public loved it, and being up, uptown on the bikes and wearing shorts. And, and uh, of course, you know, one starts wearing shorts, they all want to wear shorts. It's like somebody asked me, how, do, how can you run a police department? I said, well, if you can run a nursery, you can run a police department. He says, what do you mean? He says, well, if you give one something, like if you give one, you say it's okay for you to wear a baseball cap instead of a five-star hat, then all the rest of them want to go do it. And I said, it's the same thing. I mean, I don't care if it's the police department or nursery or whatever. If you give one, give something to one, you're going to have to give it to all of them. And uh, they got a big kick out of that, a laugh out of that. But that's the truth. Mm -hmm. It's the truth. And then we... Uh, we always had a CID division, but I sent some people to the FBI National Academy that worked for me, and I, uh, I had some of them certified on a psychological stress evaluator, which was kind of like a, a uh, polygraph, except it works on the voice, stress on the voice. And uh, there's one other thing. I started an Explorer program, uh, teaching kids what it was like to be in law enforcement and and teaching them firearms safety and, and investigative techniques and things like this. Some of the things that were, were implemented during the time that seemed to, to help. And we hired, there was uh, four or five, maybe six that we hired as uh, full-time police officers that came from our Explorer program mm -hmm. that were interested in law enforcement. During your tenure, uh, 22 years as a police chief, there were three movies made <coughs> a great part of them made in and around the city of Deland. Um, Ghost Story, Days of Thunder, and Waterboy. Can we talk a little bit about your Hollywood connection with that? Well, I was, uh, I was in my office one day and the city manager called me. He said, how about come over to my office? He said, there's somebody over here I want you to meet. He said, no, we got to decide on something. I said, okay. So I walked across the parking lot and uh, went into his office, and Mike Henry was in there. He looked familiar, but I didn't know, wasn't sure just who he was, you know, but he looked familiar. And uh, Phil introduced me to him, and uh, I said, you know, you look familiar. He said, you probably remember me as Junior. I said, that's it. Smokey and the Bandit, you're Jackie Gleason's son. That was, he said, yep, that's it. And he was the location manager for Universal. He'd been hired as location manager for this movie, Ghost Story. And uh, Phil said, you know, help them out any way you can. You know, they're going to need security. They're going to need to try and uh, they'll handle all the, the monetary situations and all that when it comes to uh, uh, getting places to film. Like the, they use the, uh, the Holiday House. They use Stetson for several of the scenes. Uh, of course, in uh, Casadega, they used the cemetery in Casadega, and that was out of our hands. But we did pro provide security for them out there in New Smyrna, uh, a couple of beach houses in New Smyrna. 
So uh, I helped Mike here all I could, you know, and I got to know him real well. And he was he was staying at a hotel, and we talked about a lot of things. We had a lot of the interests of the same. And I said, invited him to dinner one night at my house, and he came out. And my second wife, Teresa, she, she kept looking at him. He looked familiar, and I didn't tell her anything about who he was or anything else. And finally, we told her, yeah, he's a junior. And we became good friends after that. And matter of fact, he invited me to his wedding. I went to his, his wedding. He married a, a girl from Miami, Cheryl Sweeney. And uh, they're, they're still together after all these years. Mike's had some hard times because he's uh, with Parkinson's disease. But anyway, we became real good friends after that. And uh, they would come down and visit us once in a while, and they would stay at, my aunt had a condo in Daytona. They would stay over there, stay with us here in the land, and they would invite us to California. And my wife never cared anything about going out to California, but I would go. And then we were divorced not long after that, my second wife and I, and I've been to California probably three or four times to see them. And they've, they've been here probably half a dozen times before Mike got real bad real bad sick. They, when they did Smoking the Three, Mike was in Smoking the Three too, and they did that, and mainly in Dania and then uh, uh, Key Biscayne. Key Biscayne is where I met, I met Jackie Gleason in Key Biscayne. She's, but that was, uh, that was quite, a, quite an experience too. The guy's just as funny, just sitting there talking like you and I, as, as he is in the movies. I have an article here that was written in 1990 in the Volution section of the News Journal, and written by Monroe St. John's, which which was his pen name, Monroe, as you told me. That it was. That was uh, Ron Williamson. He was the uh, bureau chief for the News Journal in West Volusia. Right. It's very short. I'm going to just huh? read it. No one would dispute that Richard Slaughter is an important guy around the land. But who would think the police chief was once a Hollywood personality? Heard Richard the other day talking about the time he was in the plush polo lounge in the Beverly Hills Hotel, where the drinks cost 30 bucks. This is back in 1990. The chief had developed a close friendship with Mike Henry, who played Tarzan and other hunky film roles. When Mike was there a few years ago, scouting locations for the movie Ghost Story. That led to an invitation to visit Mike and his wife, Cheryl, in Hollywood. Anyway, the chief was getting the local lowdown from Mike when the actor explained that nobody was really anybody in Tinseltown until they had publicly been paged in the polo lounge. So Cheryl decided to give her guest a treat and made the arrangements secretly. A moment later, a bellhop walked through the famous lounge paging Richard Slaughter, broadcasting his name to all the celebrities and for a brief fleeting moment, transforming him into a Hollywood personality. Always knew there was something special about Richard. <laughs> that really I helped. get you to read that. <laughs> that shocked me. I answered the phone that was Cheryl out in the lobby. <laughs> on the lobby phone. <laughs> well, Days of Thunder and Waterboy were, were also here. Yeah, that was, uh, Jerry Reeves was in that movie also, and he was in all three of the Smokey and the Bandit movies. And he, uh, I'd met Jerry through Mike Henry before also, and, and he had called me and wanted wanted to meet me. They wanted to play a trick on the director and wanted me to meet him at the Moose Club. That's where they're having their lunches and everything because they were doing a lot of filming at the, at the football stadium there. And uh, <clears throat> so I met him down there, and it was him and... And Henry, Henry Winkler, he was in it also. He ate with us, and, uh, and my commander, uh, commander Steve Edwards, at that time, the four of us had lunch, and he said they wanted to ask about Mike Henry and how Mike was doing, and that's right after Mike had gotten uh, been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And I said, well, I talked to him once in a while, and he's he seemed to be okay right now, but you know, that's just temporarily, I guess. And he said, well. You know, we had a lot of fun doing those three movies together and all that, but they wanted to uh, pull a trick on the director. They wanted to fabricate a, a warrant and uh, 
have a police car pull in and, and arrest Adam Sandler on the, on the set, which was the football stadium. And I said, well, they said, oh, you know, just put him in there. He, he's in on it. Adam Sandler knows about it and everything. I said, well, okay, if he knows about it, all right. And he's part of the joke on the director. And so we, we went along with our little joke, you know, and had a, had a police car pull in there and read him a fabricated warrant, you know, and put him in the back seat of a patrol car. And the director was about to pull his hair out because, you know, they're operating on a pretty strict, expensive budget, too. And uh, drove him out the drove him out of the stadium, and said the, the producer didn't know what to do. The director he just pulled, wits in, and of course we just took him out and then brought him right back, and everything was fine then. <laughs> but that's what they, that's what they wanted to pull a trick on that director. Did you see Tom Cruise on that cast uh, that much on Days of well, Thunder? I met him once. Well, the mayor. The mayor was Wiley Nash at that time in the land, and his daughter, uh, Kimberly Muffet, she was a, a big dad in the wool uh, Tom Cruise fan. She loved Tom Cruise and wanted to meet him. But anything I could do where she could get to meet Tom Cruise. And so I, the mayor asked me about it, and I, I called a couple people and arranged a meeting when they were here in the land over on Tuxedo Avenue, and he had a, a motor home. That, that they had for him, and uh, we met him over there and went in, and the mayor and his wife and, and uh, Kimberly and myself and, and Tom Cruise was in there. With, I think he was in the process of marrying Nicole Kidman, or else they were married, because she was in the movie, too. She was in there with him. And we met him, and uh, we talked for probably 15 or 20 minutes, and, and uh, everybody, Muffet was starstruck, and, you know, he was a nice guy. He was very nice, and she was very nice. And uh, but Muffet got her autograph. We called her Muffet. Her name was Kimberly Nash, and, and of course Maudie, that's Mr. Nash's wife. She got an autograph too. <laughs> but uh, everybody, everybody left happy. Did something stand out as a very memorable experience, or uh, the best time of your life? Something you could tell us about. Uh, one of the most memorable experiences was when I was uh, I was hunting with a friend of mine when I was a uh, senior in high school, and his father had a had a farm in Samsula, and he had a problem with wild hogs coming out of the swamp rooting up his crops in this field, and he had just plowed these fields. He wanted us to go down in the swamp to see if we couldn't help him get rid of some of those hogs. So Johnny McCallum and I, as a matter of fact, his dad was a member of the school board back in those days. We went to Sam Sula, we saddled up the horses, went down in the swamp, found some hogs in the swamp, and we had tied the horses in the field. And uh, they ran, the, uh, the hogs ran out of the swamp, and I shot at one a couple of times, a little single action colt, and Johnny did too. And I reloaded my gun going back to my horse and put it in the holster, and I guess I left it on half cock, the only thing I could figure. And it was, like I say, it was an old single action colt. And instead of getting on a horse like you normally do, putting your foot in the stirrup, I had to swing up on it like they do in Hollywood. Well, in the process, I must have hit that hammer with my elbow because the gun went off. And the bullet went on the top part of my leg up here and came out the front part of my knee. And it was a pretty good sized bullet. It was an old 180 grain blunt nose bullet. And, uh, uh, my horse started trying to buck, started trying to throw me off, you know, and by the time he didn't throw me, I got him stopped, but my leg was numb. And I asked Johnny, I said, uh, he said, what happened? I said, I think I shot myself in the leg, John. And he got off his horse and came over, and I was still sitting on mine, he took his knife and cut my pants open, and I, and I looked at him, and like they used to say in the movies, did it just nick it? I said, did it just nick it, John? He looked up at me, and he was white as that light. He said, no, it didn't just nick it. I said, oh. And I started feeling a little green myself. But uh, anyway, I started, I could see that I could bend my leg and I knew there wasn't any bones broken. There didn't seem to be any bones broken. So we rode on back to the uh, stable, which is probably three miles from where I'd shot myself. And we unsaddled the horses and fed them and got back in the pickup truck and the nearest hospital was Sanford because we were in Sam Sula. And there was, there was no cell phones in those days or anything like that. We'd have radios, so 
there was a little, uh, little grocery store on the corner there, and uh, Johnny stopped and went in to call his dad at home and tell him what had happened and have him call my parents. And uh, he asked me if I wanted anything. I said, yeah, get me a Pepsi and a bag of Fritos. So he got me a Pepsi Cola and a bag of Fritos, and he called his dad. And uh, we went on to the hospital in Sanford. And they, they, of course, Johnny was a lot shorter than me, and I had my arm around him. We went up to the emergency room, and he'd push the buzzer, and the lady came out and said, what do you all want? She says, he's been shot. She says, oh, my God. You know, she got a wheelchair then and, and got us in there. And I was on the, we were in the emergency room, and they were trying to flush out the wound a little glass syringe thing. It was like three or four hours after I shot myself before we got to the hospital. And uh, that really hurt. They had to have a couple of people hold me on the table for that. And Mr. McCallum, John F. McCallum, he came in. He's in the emergency room. He said, you doing okay? I said, yes, sir, I'm doing okay. He said, you didn't shoot my horse, did you? I said, no, sir. I didn't shoot your horse. <laughs> so we, we fed them, and, and they're, they're all in good shape. We took the saddles off and everything else. <laughs> okay. So he was, he was happy about that, but that was one of the most memorable ones right there. And I know when I got home, my mother, my mother came and got me because my father was hunting, he and my brother, in Ocala. And uh, they had to send a deputy sheriff up because there was no phones at the camp or anything else. They sent a deputy sheriff up to tell my dad what had happened. When it, that's when he was constable. And uh, it didn't take him long to get back, you know, but my mother took me home, and I was home in bed with my leg propped up on a pillow when my dad got there and he just walked in with a pistol that I'd had, the one I'd shot myself with, still still on the empty shell where the hammer was. And he just threw it in the bed with me and said, I thought I taught you better. I turned around and walked out. <laughs> that was it. That was one of the most memorable experiences right there. And I was lucky the doctor, the doctor that uh, took care of me in Sanford he, the doctor on call was a gynecologist, and he had he had not dealt with uh, bullet holes before, and he sewed up both both holes. And when we got to the doctor here in Deland, he said he should never done that. He should left one open to drain because of a bullet wound. You know, your puncture wound, you're supposed to leave one of them open to drain. And as a result of that, I had to get two raw penicillin shots a day, and that's when that raw penicillin, little white looking stuff, and it burned like like somebody was sticking a coal on you. But I had to have that for 10 days, and and I did. But uh, that was, uh, oh, I was lucky. The doctor said if, I, if, if it had hit a bone, he said you probably wouldn't even have made it to the hospital. If that bullet had flattened out, he asked me what it was, and I told him. He's 180 grain soft nosed bullet. <coughs> he said if it had hit a bone solid, he said you'd have bled to death before you ever got here. Because, like I said, it was three or four hours after I got shot before. We got to the hospital. You were a chief for 22 years and two months. And 22 uh, years, two reading, months, two days. Reading that magazine you gave me, you were president of the Florida Police Chiefs. Florida Association. Police Chiefs, and they were remarking. And that was a, an article even said that was a, a kind of a long time for the to be police chief, relatively speaking, compared to others. Why, why do you think? I've, uh, I think I've got the record for Deland, but I know at, at the same time that I was there, there was a police chief over in uh, in South Daytona named Gary White, and he'd been there about the same length of time, maybe maybe a year or so longer than I was. And uh, of course, his department wasn't quite as large as the one that I had, but uh, still, I was you know that was another time I was really really uh, impressed that they would. Uh, elect me as the president of Florida Police Chiefs because uh, there for that year in 85 and 86, I represented all the police chiefs in the state of Florida. And I represented uh, the state of Florida at the International Police Chiefs Association meetings. So uh, it was quite an honor to do that. And I appreciated all the, all the chiefs that backed me. Would you choose this career again? Would I what? Would you choose a career in police work again? If I had to do it again, the way it is now, no way. I'd find some way to, to uh, 
beg, borrow, or steal enough money to get a law degree or something, or a accounting degree. But no, I wouldn't recommend it to any any kid growing up today to uh, law enforcement because it's uh, there's no respect for the law anymore to amount to anything, and uh, it's just uh, I just wouldn't do it. When I when I was in it, I was lucky. When I grew up in it, it was even better. There was respect for the law and all that. Uh, you could see it. You could see it kind of reversing that trend when I was in there. And uh, even the people in law enforcement, you could see a little bit of a change. I mean, they were more well educated and all that. But with the with the unions and things like that, it was. I know when I when I applied for a job. I would ask the employer that might hire me, I'd say, what can I do for you? And I'll do anything I can, you know, give me this job. But anymore, I noticed it when I was interviewing people just before I retired, so what can you do for me? That's what they want to know, what can I do for them? Not what can they do to benefit the police department, you know. And that, that stuck in the back of my mind. I said, you know, I don't know if I want this guy or not. What advice would you give to a young person today? Get a college degree if there's any way you can. Go to college, uh, get a, a, a bachelor's degree, at least a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a doctor's degree, go into law or, or anything like that, but not a, I wouldn't recommend law enforcement to anybody. It pays more now, it has to, but it pays more than it ever did. <coughs> I never made $70,000 a year in my life the whole time I was there, 22 years. And they, I think they hired the last, the last police chief that uh, took my place. Well, he came up through the rank because I hired him. Originally, I hired. <coughs> and I think they started him at around $25,000, $30,000 a year more than I was making when I retired after being there for 20, 22 years. So they have to pay him more now. But, but they, you know... He worked for it too. He got his college education like a lot of them. He, he didn't have it when he came to, to work for the PD. He had to work part time or work full time and go to school part time for probably 10 years to get his degree. But it's worth it in the long run. I mean, I, I, I would recommend any kid get, a, get an education. That's, that's something that nobody can ever take away from you. I mean, they can take your house, they can take your car, somebody can take your life. But once you get that sheep, sheep skin, you know, that degree, they can't take it away from you. When you go, they, that goes with you. <coughs> That's for sure. How would you like to be remembered? Just probably as a person that, uh, that uh, tried to keep the land a safe place to live in a... Uh, great and fun place to raise a family. Well, we thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure interviewing you. Thank you sharing for sharing with me. <laughs> sharing your memories and experience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.